Thank you so much for your beautiful film. Yeah, um, yeah I think one of the, the striking things about this work is as a viewer, you feel like you're stumbling upon um, kind of like lost archive or of documentary footage or something. There's this intimacy um, to the cinematography and the sound. And I just wondered if you could start by speaking about how you found your approach to the material, if it was kind of along the <coughs> process or you kind of knew from the start. I think going about the research for showing the, for just making the film, I was really interested. I started making images mostly like through stills and then it became motion picture. And I guess I'm mostly kind of, not mostly, but I am interested in the idea of portraiture. And coming into making the film, there's this idea of how can you make a portrait of someone without them in the frame. Um, you think about syntax, you think about era specificity, um, you think about mannerisms. And that was like a huge thing for me coming into because I didn't, I was thinking about this before I even considered uh, reaching out to Benny. So it was like, damn, who looks like this guy? <laughs> and like at first, you know, <laughs> I'm really gullible, so if like I'm really really willing to collaborate with anybody, so like my first person who I was considering to shoot with Jimmy is like six three, like <laughs> like two fifty. I'm like yeah, let's do it. Like you like balling, <laughs> like we could do this. <laughs> and um, and then I was like oh wow, Benny, who I met here in New York in 2018 is for a weekend. I rem recalled it, and um, but yeah, I guess. With making Jimmy, it was this idea of like weaving things that were biographical to him, and also bio autobiographical to me. Like everything is, everything we create is autobiographical. Um, but just returning to this idea of like capturing essence, a lot of the research wasn't done from a scholarly approach. It was, it was, it was trying to find the things that go beyond the research, um, things that are fictional, but at the same time, all fiction is from experience. Yeah, and you mentioned just now about making a portrait of someone without them in it. And I wondered about the the first section on Istanbul, where it is distinct from the rest of the film, in that, in my imagination, I thought it's Baldwin. It's his perspective. But I just wondered about the two sections and what you're thinking there. Right, Istanbul, I didn't think I was going to go out there until, like, the last week I was in Paris. It was really just on a whim. It w but on a whim, but at the same time, there was this homage to 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 Baldwin's time in Istanbul. I'm not sure how many people know that he spent about like 12, 13 years of his life there. Istanbul was to Paris what Paris was to America. Um, it saved his life after he was denied for making the biopic about Malcolm X because they said it was too radical. It crushed him because he just wanted to make films with 16 millimeter cameras and kind of reclaim this idea, not the idea, when you're an artist, it's who you are, not what you do. But he just wanted to have, uh, he had spent so much time writing and built this illustrious career of what he can do. So when you um, pr pr approach it, well not approach, but propose to someone like, hey, I can do this, and when you're denied that, it, it can be crippling when you, they don't amount all your, they amount all your efforts to just one side of like who you might be or what you can contribute to the art space or the world. Um, so Istanbul was, a lot of the films I made before this were uh, kind of inspired through like cinema verite, letting like the, the lens be the eye, which I was really inspired by this French dude named Jean Rouch. Um, he kind of coined this idea of cinema verite and letting the world unfold right in front of you. And I like to think I do, a pre I, I like looking, we all like seeing. Um, but I, I, I really, I find a really a lot of beauty in the mundane and trying to use my my handheld camera to uh, like find with uh, profundity and try to create this physicality in my shooting style. Um, uh, I like running with the camera. I'm like if I try, just try to be really open to my sensibilities in that way. So Istanbul was really welcoming to that as well because um, it takes two to collaborate. Um, the city was really welcoming and just and I, I felt how one could, it's not east, it's not the east or the west. Um, it really kind of collapsed into itself after the Ottoman Empire and not taking on the influences of both. So just saying like, you know, you just go where you're welcomed. And it was kind of familiar to how 
I could see how Baldwin could fall in love with a place like this. Like I, I'm, I'm everywhere. People are just like, we all don't speak English, but everybody know what chai means. Like chai, chai. It's like tea, tea. And like yeah, I'm just like Madeba. I'm just trying to like use my Google Maps to translate however I could. Um, but just being welcomed um, was just an understatement, and it was it was kind of life changing still just to be in Istanbul and, and being welcomed and into the presence and you know meeting people who um, were familiar with Baldwin's home uh, that, that that he had when he lived in Istanbul and kind of going through those images and trying to retrace those steps going to the uh, Galata Bridge um, uh, watching um, the Sadak Piquet film in Istanbul um, when he's following James Baldwin uh, like archival footage from years ago um, those were inspirations behind going there as well can you say more about the sound, the sound design, and the the composition? So incredible, and um, the just collaborating pro collaborating with um, the composer on on making that. Is it cool if he just comes comes up? Yeah. Paco. Okay. <laughs> Paco. Yep. Me and Paco met in two thousand. 20 actually during COVID I used to take these really long walks and uh, I just saw Paco playing tennis with himself on a tennis uh, ball handball court and he was visiting Paris uh, studying at the Manhattan School of Music um, me and Paco worked on a few f projects together and the way we do it, it's like again like it's this idea of collaborate this idea but the truth in collaboration where you release control when you're working with someone if, if you trust them if you're collaborating I, you'd hope to and um the picture was already finished. It was kind of like a silent film. And then Paco breathed life into it uh, with his composition, which I didn't hear until I went to Paris to hear it. I just gave him, I gave him, I just I hinted at what uh, I was feeling here with the, the mode of, the mood of the film was here and there. And kind of just allowed to, not allow it, but just let him do his thing. Like, I don't do sound, he does sound. and. Um, it's beautiful. It's it's it, it it really just it's so um you can speak to it obviously, but it's just so responsive to the movements. It's like the camera work. And similar with the sound design, Baco who who isn't here at the moment. Um but yeah, you should. Mm -hmm. Hey. Um yeah, to to tell a few things about it and, and my process. Um it was a nice challenge for me because, uh, yeah, as yesterday I said, it was it's almost like a, a silent film, so the music has to play like a, a, a narrative role as well, like almost as much as, as the as the images. So um, this for me was a challenge to uh, to find a nice balance between like, um, well. Yeah, putting some narrative and leaving some space as well because it's very contemplative and it's 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 good that it stayed that way uh, as well. And uh, what else could I say? Um, no, there is a lot of influences in this. Um, for instance, I don't know if you've seen uh, Birdman by Inyaritu. There is this whole um, part in the um, in the original score, which is like just solo drums improvised, and I really liked uh, this idea of having like a, just one instrument uh, improvising. So I I left a lot of space uh, uh, to that as well. And uh, what else? No, yeah, I don't know. If you have any question uh, about it, I I'm happy to to answer. <laughs> Yeah, the the only thing with like Paco that I was advising um, was like I would just go through the time marks of like each each time when when, when things to fade in, when things to fade out. What I was feeling here, I would send like a few references, but I didn't try to. I didn't want to ever um, impose what I was thinking for it, like to influence what he was feeling. And I'm curious about some of the diegetic sound. It sounded like there was some foley and maybe some stuff you recorded on set as well. Yeah, we, I did Foley every all of it when I came back to New York because it's Bolex, so it doesn't record any of the sound. Well, it, you can, but it, you'd hear the the motor. Um, so I did all that when I came back to New York, just like watching it and then going to the park, like taping a uh, sound mic to my my ankle, going to the like crumpling up, like like I got a knife and like the apple, and I start cutting it the same way, and I'm like 
I got a little teapot and I'm like stirring the water. Um, it's all very involved and trying to, yeah. So yeah, that's that's the part of the diegetic and a lot of that stuff we also did on 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 set as well. I would uh, Sinai and Benny, uh, the dancing of the sheets, you know, just like the cat and mouse scene uh, through the <laughs> through the hotel. Um, yeah, we 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 mic them up and just like had fun. Uh, that hotel is like Hotel Louisiana in the second arrondissement. Uh, a lot of artists stayed there in the '60s and the '50s, and uh, just shooting it in general was in like during holiday in, in August. So the entire uh, entire city was quiet, and we got to because of our economic limitations, um, we we're just trying to focus on the foreground to kind of just refocus on the essence of Baldwin and what we could control. What we, we couldn't control in the background, but um, Hotel Louisiana was really generous, and but yeah, with them we just taped it to their wherever it made sense, and it was let them chase. And can you also speak to the selection of the text? Yeah, um, the selection of the text, the text that comes up in the end is uh, an excerpt from No Name in the Street. Um, and then also, uh, as I was saying before, in terms of like weaving this idea, these things that were both uh, biographical and, and auto, a lot of those were my own, uh, just like scribing in the park. Um, whenever like, a tough day of shooting, um, like sometimes it's really hard. You just need like a break. We shot for maybe like nine days straight, um, maybe fifteen days, but like maybe two days of like breaking when there was just things that happened on set. Uh, and just to refocus and just kind of, again, just draw things back to the essence, not get too overwhelmed with, you know, like uh, driving in a car for like an hour with like this beautiful this SD. Um, but just like recentering those things and opening myself up to the sensibilities and trying to not think what would Baldwin it was never like the, 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 the question of like, what would Baldwin be saying now? It was just like how I'm feeling. And um, just trying to be really aware and having like this emotional sense of where I'm at and why I'm doing this. So a lot of those writings in the end also just came from from my own like I don't like flies, but it's not a bee, so I'll let it be, you know, um, things like that. Um, but that that's one of my favorite books by Baldwin as well. No name in the street. Um, it's just like you're just kind of like following his notes. It's kind of like just it's just this uh, just a flu. flu, flu Fluidity of thought that I think really travels really well in that book, um, which I read and just kind of kept with me throughout the making of it. Let's open up to questions. Um, yes, here. We have a mic right next to you. Sure, to your right. Oh, uh, hi. Well, I'm curious about the point you mentioned about the scholarly engagement with the texts, because in No Name and the Street, but also many other essays uh, Baldwin wrote in Paris. I mean, much of the text is about the structural racism of the French state, uh, Baldwin's interactions with other black folks, his interactions with North African folks, and so forth. Uh, we see little to none of that in the film. So I was curious like how, because in scholarly work, the framing is so central, and it's by choice. So I was wondering why this choice to frame Baldwin as such, and who's the audience you had in mind? Right. Um, so the research that I did do was, it's, it's like a, it was a bit more looser. And again, it wasn't the intention of like being as accurate with, with, with scholarly research or, um, but the points that I, I did try to be as specific was with where we were staying, like these were no longer um, the Algerian quarters, but staying in the 18th amongst the, the Maghreb or staying amongst the North Africans, excuse me, the West African communities staying in Chateau Rouge, like um, when he's walking through the streets uh, in the African communities, like you hear like subtle things, like you hear laughter of like mockeries that I think like you can find in between the disparities between black Americans and maybe West Africans through colonialism. Um, it's, it's perhaps not as obvious, but like through location and places that I would go and do scouting and for having him living, those are the things that I would try to be as specific as possible too. Um, and I guess for the audience, I think the audience can be, uh, not to be like implicit, but you know, like those who love jazz, those who 
are interested in this idea of uh, maybe like individuality and like finding this centralization that it's not, the film isn't necessarily about queerness, but the cost of denying someone um, the right to a love that's either public or private. Um, I think for Baldwin lovers or the si or those who love analog films, 16 millimeter, I think it's, yeah, that's my answer. I think we have time for one more question. Stop here. First and foremost, I want to say that was really an engaging experience. And the way you use light and the lack thereof throughout the film is really engaging. Um, especially the staircase scenes, uh, I really like those. But my question, the way you use dialogue in the film feels very intentional, maybe because it's only in a few portions. And you were saying earlier that it's a it's almost a silent film. So how do you decide when to use that dialogue, what that dialogue would be, et cetera? Yeah, I, I think I didn't quite know until um, I got back home to New York. Um, I think with the dialogue, um, the verbiage of like just just the lyricness, the l being lyrical with like just like speech wasn't like, surprising. Like wasn't like a huge, it wasn't as pertinent to me as it might seem for a voice like someone as Baldwin's, and it just didn't seem uh, a priority for me to um, not even like replicate that or to like add on to that. Um, I just kind of to want to like strip it all bare and kind of like seeing him for what he might have imagined for himself, just just watching someone discover themselves um, when they have the right to desire in a place that is foreign to them. Um, that that not even a, a discovery, it's just this uncovering of such. Um, letting the language kind of breathe through, through the music. And the selection kind of comes, yeah, like when he first comes from, uh, when he first gets in the car and like where are you from i'm from new york and uh and, and just towards the end as well it's 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 just this idea of you know after one becomes kind of acquainted with their surroundings how comfortable one can be to finally start creating one doesn't just be like find you have to find your voice it doesn't just come when you arrive it comes through the makings through um i actually wrote this down in my hand uh it comes um uh, beneath the joy, there's there's anguish, and uh, beneath the amazement, there's also fear. And um, that's the language I wanted to, to, to lead with, uh, the essence, rather, yeah, just verbiage. Because we can we can talk all day, but you know we have two ears to to hear, and we have two nostrils to smell, and we don't have one mouth. We have two eyes to see. So, just absorbing, rather than output. I think we have to leave it there, but thank you we'll both you so after, much. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.